In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And he was a Samaritan. That is the key to this text. And he was a Samaritan. From the Jewish perspective, the Samaritans were only a half step above Gentiles and pagans. The Jews despised the Samaritans, and it had to do with history. When the lands were being invaded from the east, the Samaritans had made a separate treaty so that they would not be destroyed as Judah and Israel had been destroyed and they did not support the armies of Judah and Israel. They were hated. The Samaritans did not worship at the temple in Jerusalem. They worshiped on what they called a holy mountain. To the faithful Jew, the Samaritans followed the same God, but in all the wrong way. They had quirks about their worship. They did not have a neatly packaged theology. The Samaritans then were outcast, outlanders of society. Uh, Jesus once told a parable about a Samaritan. A man was beaten and robbed and thrown in the ditch to die, and the religious leaders pass on by on the other side of the road. But it was a Samaritan who saved the man who was dying. We know it as the good Samaritan, almost as if tongue-in-cheek, Maybe there are some good ones out there, the Jews would have said, but we don't know them. The healing of the ten lepers is a story that is truly unsettling to the hearers of it and those who saw it. Leprosy was considered to be Highly contagious. Now, not all leprosy that they grouped under a large category is what we know as Hansen's disease. By the way, if you don't go out and catch armadillos because they have that bacteria in them, or at least use gloves in your armadillo catching. But Leviticus law required that anyone who had an eruption of any kind go to a priest and let the priest diagnose whether or not it was leprous. And if the priest said it was leprous, you went into quarantine with all the other leprosy, types of leprosy. It could have been a boil, it could have been shingles, and yes, it could have been Hansen's disease. To make matters worse, not only were you isolated from family and friends and your work, whenever you went around with a group of lepers, you had to cry out, unclean, unclean. 
In this group of ten, there were nine Jews and one Samaritan. And in unison, they cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. You see, the priests were the dermatologists of the day. And if they verified that you were clean, you could go back to living the way you were. And as they are going to the priest, suddenly the disease is no longer with them. The Greek term is that they are made clean. Not healed, but clean. Made. So they could go back about in society. And one of the men looked down and saw He was cleansed, he stopped, and he started shouting with a loud voice, giving thanks to God, and then he sprinted down and fell at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. The other nine, Why, they are never heard from again. No praising God, no turning around, and no thanking Jesus. These, the elect of Israel, from them we hear nothing. And he was a Samaritan. It was this one ostracized who actually had a living faith. Not the so-called elect. It is my contention that Herman Melville understood Luke and the point that Luke makes that outcast often have great faith. The first line in Melville's book, Moby Dick, is this. They call me Ishmael. Now, Why did Melville choose that name? Out of any name, Ishmael is the only one that survived the sinking of the Pequod, the whaling ship. And if you know your Bible, Ishmael is the offspring of Abraham and the Egyptian maid. Hagar. And it is Ishmael and Hagar who are driven out of Abraham and Sarah's sight to die in the desert. They are outcasts. Melville is marvelous in this book. One of the most fascinating characters in Moby Dick is the character character Queequeg. Now, Queequeg is a pagan native of some South Sea island. He has tattoos all over him. But he is also a great harpoonist. When Queequeg wants to get a job on the Pequod whaling ship, 
They say, you're a pagan. We're Christians. You can't have the job. And Melville kind of punches those of us who are reading it. And they rejected uh, Queequeg until they saw him throw a harpoon. Then they dropped all pretenses of their Christian faith in order for the prophet that he would bring in. And Queequeg is isolated from the rest of the crew. And Melville portrays him as the wise, the one with wisdom and depth, greater than the entire rest of the crew of that ship. And it is this pagan, as you read through the book, that shows more compassion and concern than any other members of the crew. Twice he risked his life diving into the sea to save a drowning sailor when no one else would. He even saved one who mocked him constantly. And Melville challenges the reader through this character that there are many who might claim the name of religion, have the form of religion, as the Apostle Paul says, but do not have the power of it living within them. In essence, Queequeg's Christian ethic is greater than those who claimed Christ. And the same is true of this Samaritan. Only one returns. Praising God thanking Jesus. The others just disappear on the horizon there. The outcast has a relationship with God. The other nine, we can only surmise, well, I shouldn't have gotten the disease in the first place. Well, it's about time, God, but I'm still angry at you for making me go through this. Have mercy, Jesus. Oh, by the way, heal us in time so we can get back before closing time so I can check on the shop. Now, I got to tell you, it's a good thing I'm not God. Everybody knows that. It's a good thing I'm not God. Because by the time those guys, those nine guys got to the priest, they would have been nothing but skeletons if I'd been God, because they would have gotten it and eaten them up before. No. God is not vindictive in that way. But you see, I suspect those nine died later from something called hardness of heart. It's a kind of leprosy of the soul. It gnaws away at our soul until there's nothing left. And it is a tendency for us card-carrying Christians to indeed pray fervently when we are in need. And when something happens, our memories are so short. Life as usual are 
What have you done for me lately, Lord? It's a tendency for us to think that because we profess Christ, that God owes us. And I wonder sometimes if we carry the name without the substance and the power of the living God within us. And the tendency for us as Christians to forget the genesis of all the good things if we would just look. And then blame God for when anything happens that we don't really like. A tendency for us as card-carrying Christians to have cold hearts than the hearts of flesh that beat in rhythm with God's life. Now, I will tell you, this text is tricky in the Greek. You see, there are two gifts. The gift of cleansing, katharo, from which we derive the word catharsis. That's the cleansing of the leprosy. But there is also another word. The second gift is not apparent, especially not in the English translation where Jesus says to the man, your faith has made you well. It sounds like he's just reinforcing the first gift, the cleansing of the leprosy. But St. Luke distinguishes between the two. Your faith has made you, comes from the word sozo. Not well, but it has made you whole. It has made you complete. It is also, this Greek verb, is also the one from which we derive saved. Your faith has made you whole. The second gift. Your faith has restored you to wholeness and fullness with God. Your soul has been reunited. With the movement of God. And now you are able to go your way and have a real life. And he was a Samaritan. You know there are those out there we cannot judge. We cannot judge the quality of their being. And I have found personally that oftentimes greater faith exists in those cast out than the ones who cast them out. The book of Hebrews reminds us to treat strangers well. For some in doing so have entertained angels. So often the Bible uses the outcasts, those we deem outcasts, to show and spread a light 
on those who think we have cornered the market on faith. And we find from them a greater faith. One that goes beyond our own. I call them biblical surprises. We can think back of Rahab the harlot. As a matter of fact, do a search on the lineage of Jesus. Fascinating. All in the family. And yet that's the lineage from which Christ came. God used the broken to raise up God's grace and faith. His name was Quiquick. His name was Ishmael. And he was a Samaritan. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us worship God with God's